2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Finally, brethren, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. So Paul constantly asked other Christians to pray for him. This is found in Romans 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 6, Philippians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and Philemon chapter 1. And so Paul knew that the success of his ministry in some measure depended on the prayers of God's people. So you cannot tell how much God's servants are helped by the prayers of his people. The strongest man in Israel will be the better for the prayers of the weakest saint in Zion. And so Paul's great concern, uh, what he first asked the Thessalonian Christians to pray for, was that God's word be free to do its work among others, even as it had among the Thessalonians, right? Just as it is with you. So Paul asked for prayer so that the word can run freely without any hindrance. Paul's prayer request makes us wonder how often the work of God's word is hindered by our prayerlessness. So God has promised that his word would be free and perform its work. Uh, Isaiah 55 verse 11, It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So, But as with many of God's promises, we are expected to take this promise in faith and in prayer to ask God to perform the promise for his glory. And so, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. So these were those who wanted to hinder the work of the gospel. Paul wanted God to deliver him from such men or change them into reasonable and godly men, one way or the other. Verse 3 through 5. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So even if not all men have faith, the Lord is faithful. This was the basis of Paul's confidence in God's ability to establish and guard us from the evil one. And God promised to keep Satan on a leash. He would not allow any temptation to become too great for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And will not allow Satan to do whatever he wants with us in Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. So Paul was also confident in the Lord regarding the Thessalonians themselves, that they would follow through and be obedient to God's word. This is going to show that God's work of establishing and guarding us is done, in part through his appeal to our will in obeying his word. So God doesn't just pour spiritual maturity and stability into us. He works it in us through our cooperation with his will. So towards this end, Paul wisely prayed for both love and patience or endurance for the Thessalonian Christians. These were two qualities essential for the kind of spiritual stability and strength that these Thessalonians needed. Verse 6, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. So the strength of this statement is plain. It's not only a command, it's also made in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul defined the disorderly as those who did not walk according to the tradition, the, the pattern of teaching and living uh, that Paul and the apostles gave to them. So churches should never withdraw from someone because he fails to conform to man's traditions or teachings. The only standard to uphold is the apostolic tradition and teachings. The present tense of the verb walks is going to denote that it is a deliberate course of action. Their disorderly conduct is not an occasional lapse. It is a persistent practice. And so Paul had already told the Thessalonians to warn the unruly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Apparently that problem still remained in some measure, and he told them to, uh, to now dis discipline the unruly ones in question. The purpose in withdrawing from the obedient was not so much punishment, but more so simply to deny these disobedient ones the aid and comfort of the fellowship of the body of Christ until they repented. It put them out of the church into the domain of Satan or the world, and hoped that they might miss the fellowship of the church so much that they would repent of their disobedience. 
And Paul echoed this same idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. The purpose was to bring about repentance and salvation in the disobedient ones, not to condemn or damn them. So in an indirect way, Paul showed that his vision for the church was that it should be a place of love and comfort, that one would genuinely feel sad and sorry to be excluded from the church. Churches today should also fit that description. Verse 7 through 9. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. So Paul was an excellent example among the Thessalonians in that he worked hard to support his own needs. This wasn't because the apostles like Paul didn't have the right to request support. Instead, it was because that he wanted to set a good example of hard work and prove, uh, prove false any accusation that he preached the gospel for personal gain. And so to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. So therefore, the Thessalonians should follow Paul in his example of both hard work and willingness to sacrifice for the furtherance and integrity of the gospel. Verse 10, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So simply put, Paul says that if anyone will not work, instead of cannot work, neither shall he eat. God's plan is to provide for our needs through our work. So since God is able to provide through our needs in any manner imaginable, it means something that he has chosen, for the most part, to meet our needs through work. This is part of God's character because he's a busy God and always at work. Verse 11 through 13. For we hear that there are some among who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. So the idleness of some had become a source of sin. It's not, it was not only because of the work that they didn't do, but also because of the harm they did do with their idle time. They were busybodies. And there is a play on words between the ancient Greek phrasing in the lines, not working at all, and but are busybodies. Uh, the idea is something like busybodies who do no business. And so perhaps these busybodies thought if Jesus was coming soon, then it made no sense to work. And so it would then be easy for them to intrude into the lives of others and take advantage of Christian generosity. And so it is the inactive drones whom Paul is berating here, those who live by the sweat of others while they themselves do nothing for the common good to help the human race such as our monks and priests who acquire ample dimensions by their inactivity. So with authority through our Lord Jesus, Paul commanded these busybodies to work, to get out of the business of others in quietness, and to provide for their own needs, eat their own bread, instead of expecting other Christians to provide for them. The early church did provide for the truly needy among them, but only after being certain that they were truly needy and after putting them to work for the church. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3 through 16, where it says, Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone, trusting God, and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. All and these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under sixty years old be taken to the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. So, Paul forbids these Thessalonians to encourage their laziness by indulging it and teaches that it is those who pro prove themselves with the necessities of life by honorable and useful work that lead a life of holiness. And so do not grow weary in doing good. This is proper encouragement for those who are working as they should. Few things are more wearying than seeing others take advantage of Christian generosity. But we should never let the manipulations of some discourage us from doing good to the truly needy. 
The older King James will have it like this. Do not be weary in well-doing. There is plenty of well-wishing in the world. Well-resolving, well-suggesting, well-criticizing are found, are also found in plenty. Many people are good at well-talking, but there is not enough of simple well-doing. And so there are many excuses one might make to allowing weariness in doing good, but they should all be rejected, right? It takes so much effort to keep doing good, but you will extend effort towards the things of the world. Or it takes so much self-denial to keep doing good, but it's worth it when we consider the reward. Or it just brings me persecution to do good, but your persecutions are nothing compared to that which others have suffered. People don't respond and there are little results when I do good. But remember how slow you were to respond to Jesus Christ. And it doesn't earn much gratitude when I do good. But God sends many blessings even to those who do not thank or appreciate him. Verse 14 and 15. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So here Paul finished the thought introduced in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6. Here he elaborates on what it means to withdraw from a brother as mentioned previously. To withdraw means to note that person and do not keep company with him with the purpose of causing him to be ashamed. Yet the purpose is not to make him an enemy of the church, but through the severity of the withdrawal from fellowship to warn and admonish him as an erring brother. So the the intention of excommunication is not to drive men from the Lord's flock, but it's rather to bring them back again when they have wandered and gone astray. Excommunication is to be distinguished from anathema. All right, verse 16 through 18. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So Paul's blessing of peace, always in every way, was appropriate for this church experiencing both persecution and tribulation. It is the presence of the Lord of peace that will grant them this peace. And so as was his custom, Paul himself wrote the final words of the epistle with his own hand. This was both a personal demonstration of affection and proof that the letter was authentic. And uh, for Paul, God's grace was the beginning and the end of the Christian life. It was appropriate that this letter and most of his letters began and ended with the mention of grace. So there is the addition of one little word at this final benediction as compared with its form in the first epistle. It is the word all. Thus the apostle takes those whom he had been rebuking and correcting and so reveals the greatness of his heart and his love. Peace be with you, or you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And so thus he poureth out his affection by prayer upon prayer for them, which is a sweet closing up.